Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining PHCA for today's webinar, PHC, PHCA Election Overview 2018, Where Do the Candidates Stand on Our Issues and in the Polls? I'm Wendy Johnson with the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. PHCA offers monthly webinars to members to receive updates from department staff on regulations, learn from industry experts on current trends and practices, and to gain a better understanding of practical application tools to equip you so that you may continue to provide the highest level of quality care possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the PHCA website later today. The webinar has been approved for one continuing education credit for PHCA members. Credits will be uploaded to NAB within the next two weeks for those of you who have provided us with your unique NAB registry number. I'll be sending a link to a quick survey. Your feedback is important to us and to our speaker, so please take a moment to complete the survey. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. However, throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit questions using your questions pane on the right hand of your screen and our presenter will address them at the end of the presentation. Now for today's webinar. Today's webinar is being presented by our very own Zach Schamberg, Director of Advocacy and Legislative Affairs here at the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. With just a week to go before the 2018 general election, Pennsylvanians are being inundated with political postcards, emails, phone calls, and television advertisements. Every candidate is telling us he or she deserves the privilege of representing us, but which candidates will truly support and defend long-term care issues after they're sworn into office in January? With a tight governor's race, a U.S. Senate race, 18 highly competitive congressional seats up for grabs and numerous state House and Senate seats in a wide open race, Pennsylvania will be in the national spotlight once ballots are cast next Tuesday, November 6th. During today's webinar, Zach will share with you who the real front runners are, who the surprise candidates may be, and where some of the more well-known legislators stand on issues affecting nursing homes, personal care homes, and assisted living residents. Additionally, PHCA put out, for the first time ever, a legislative questionnaire to candidates running for office. This questionnaire gave us a firm understanding of how candidates perceive long-term care in Pennsylvania and whether or not they'll support our stances if elected. Zach, Zach will be sharing the results of this questionnaire on today's webinar. I'll now turn the webinar over to Zach. Thanks, Wendy. Wow, that is a lot to live up to in that description. I should have known better when I wrote that description of this webinar, but we've got a lot to cover today. Um, I want to thank everybody again for joining us this morning. We are one week from the 2018 midterm election, and I'm sure that you're just as tired as I am of the constant television ads, of the constant mailings that you're receiving. Yesterday, I had nine pieces of mail in my mailbox um, telling me that my congressman was either the best candidate to ever run for office or that he would um, cause disaster across the United States. So I'm not really sure what to believe anymore. But um, on this webinar, as Wendy said, I'm going to discuss some of those candidates. I'm going to discuss where they stand on the issues, um, where they stand on our issues, and try to walk you through some of the things that you can do uh, as it pertains to welcoming a candidate in or how we move forward after this election and, and what we can do to start building some of those relationships. So again, thank you for joining us today, and let's get started. Um, I want to give you first my election background, and I promise I cannot find a better picture of myself than that one. Um, you know, I'm often asked, are you sure you know what you're talking about? And that question, while it mostly comes from my wife, I, I do want to tell you that in as we're talking about the election, um, 
on this subject, I, I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about. And, I, and I've been an intern for um, then Congressman Pat Toomey when he was running for the U.S. Senate. I was a campaign manager for Todd Stevens, who's a current state rep um, down in southeastern Pennsylvania. I was also his chief of staff. And since 2014, PHCA has been nice enough to keep me on as their director of advocacy and legislative affairs. And, you know, I did run for class president, and that graphic is wrong. I actually got seven votes, so I'm not sure who put that up, but uh, we can get that changed. So let's look at, at Pennsylvania. Let's take a step back and from the 50,000-foot level, take a look at this state. And Wendy told you in the introduction that we are very much in the national spotlight, and that is true. If you read the New York Times, the Washington Post, I've seen it in the Los Angeles Times, um, newspapers and television outlets all across the country are talking about Pennsylvania, especially as it pertains to Congress, because we've got some of the most competitive races in the entire country. And most who think that the U.S. House could flip from Republican to Democrat or possibly from um, in the U.S. Senate from Republican to Democrat are looking at Pennsylvania's races. But to take a step back, everyone on this call has state and federal legislators who represent your facilities or where you live. Um, in Pennsylvania, we've got 203 state representatives. We've got 50 state senators. We have 18 U.S. representatives or members of Congress. And we've got two U.S. senators. That's Pat Toomey, who's a Republican, and Bob Casey, who's a Democrat. Bob Casey is up for re-election this year. Pat Toomey was up for re-election in one of the most highly contested races um, two years ago in 2016. So let's boil these dynamics down to the parties. Pennsylvania is a really interesting state because we have Democrat Tom Wolf as our governor. We've got a Democratic state treasurer. We've got a Democratic attorney general. But Republicans hold overwhelming majorities in the state House and Senate. There are 121 Republicans to only 82 Democrats in the state House. And there's 40, 34 Republicans and 16 Democrats in the state Senate, effectively giving Republicans what's called a veto-proof majority in the Senate. And that, those levels are very rarely reached. That would mean that if Governor Tom Wolf wanted to veto a bill and it went back to the Senate, the Senate could override his veto. Again, I don't know that that has been reached or those levels have been reached in over 100 years. Let's look at the congressional level. It was actually 13 to 5, 13 Republicans and only five Democrats earlier this year. But one Republican resigned. Uh, Republicans lost the special election out in western Pennsylvania. That was the Connor Lamb versus Rick Saccone race. And we lost another congressman who left early, Charlie Dent, about two months ago, giving up his seat. And you'll, you'll remember that the two open seats are Charlie Dent and Pat Mann. Um, Charlie Dent had the Harrisburg suburbs to, to the Allentown suburbs, and Pat Mann had southeast Pennsylvania – in one of the most egregiously drawn seats in the entire country. And we're going to look at that map a little bit later. But as it stands now, at least in Pennsylvania, we've got 10 Republicans, six Democrats, and two wide open seats. So in Pennsylvania in 2018, in one week, we're going to go to the polls and we're going to vote. Pennsylvania is a very busy state, this election cycle. And it goes back to why I said we are the focus of the entire country. Check this out. All 203 state House seats are up for re-election. There are 25 state Senate seats open for, re for re-election. Uh, 18 congressional seats, all 18 are up. We've got the one U.S. Senate seat, and we've got a tightening gubernatorial race. But before we look at this year's election, okay, I want to go back in time for a moment to – Okay, that, that, that's – all right, sorry. That's a little too far back. Let me try this again. Uh, okay, there we go. November 8, 2016. So November 8, 2016 was a very interesting day, and I remember this. I'm a big Marvel fan. Doctor Strange was the, the number one movie that day. 
Uh, we had the Chain Smokers Closer, great song. Escape Clause was is a great book. If you haven't read it, go out and read it. That was the number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And I'm trying to think. There was – oh, yeah, okay. There was – one other thing that happened on November 8th, 2016. Donald Trump shocked the world and was elected president. And this election sent a seismic shift over our entire political process because after Trump won, he proved every poll, every pundit, every prognosticator wrong. And he forever changed the way that we look at and predict elections. And if you look at his administration, some of the accomplishments they've had, but some of the goals that they've they outlined, especially during the 2016 election, but still haven't got to the finish line. Um, what what were they and how are they going to influence this election? So, you know, Republicans, as they're campaigning all across the country and here in Pennsylvania, you hear about the economy. It's the economy is the number one issue that Republicans are touting, especially the federal tax cuts. Um, unemployment is at an all-time low. The stock market, though, in the last few days has gone up and down. Um, we're seeing all-time highs almost on a weekly basis in the stock market. And the Republicans aren't touting it as much in Pennsylvania, especially in the southern states. Uh, you'll hear them talk about the Supreme Court justices confirmed, and that's a big feather in the cap for uh, Republicans and President Trump. Now, they didn't get Obamacare um, – stripped away. They didn't do a repeal and replace. That is still very much on the table. And I know something that if the House stays Republican and the Senate stays Republican, something that they will likely try again. If you'll recall one of the president's earliest um, State of the Union addresses, he talked about a big infrastructure initiative. Um, that has still yet to come to fruition. So Republicans are still looking at pouring over a trillion dollars into infrastructure. And of course, at every Trump rally you hear build the wall, that wall is still not built. Um, that's something that Republicans are still talking about, especially again in southern states, but it's still not done. So the question is, are Republicans going to focus more on what's been done already, or are they going to look at the last two years and say, um, we didn't accomplish what we wanted? And will that keep voters from voting? We're not sure. That remains to be seen. But if you look at those accomplishments and those goals, no matter what they may be, we can't escape from the tweets. Chances are, when you hear about the president, this is what you're going to see. No matter what the issue is, you're going to hear about the tweets. And there's an old saying that all politics is local. I, however, don't think that that saying, all politics is local, applies anymore. The number one question that members of Congress, state reps, and state senators get is what do you think of President Trump. So I'm going to change that saying and say today, all politics is really national. And I can tell you that I've done doors in Pennsylvania, especially in the Southeast, and I've done doors with Republican candidates for, state, for the State House. And I've had the door slammed on me because um, – I told them that I was with a Republican candidate, and they said, President Trump is a Republican. You're a Republican. We don't want to talk to you. Again, all politics this year, and probably for the next two years, all politics is national. So let's look at the top issues for voters this year. Um, a, a few polls, and I, I've tried to compile a bunch of these polls um, on what voters – truly care about and what they're going to the polls to vote for. Um, and in these polls, we see that health care, believe it or not, and I was frankly surprised to see this, health care is the number one issue. 30% of voters are going to vote based on health care. The economy and jobs is number two at 21%. Guns, still a big issue, obviously, at 15%. Immigration, especially with this southern caravan coming, maybe that will gain traction and send people to the polls. That's at 15%. Tax cuts and tax reform 
um, at only 7% right now. Maybe that's why Republicans aren't touting as much as as much as maybe they need to. And um, I do know that one guy in Lebanon County answered Penn State football is his number one issue. And and I know these things are anonymous, but I, I do have a feeling that that guy was Russ McDade, our CEO. Now, I'm not sure what Congress can do about Penn State football, but he's very concerned. All right, let's take a look at the makeup of the entire U.S. Senate. Um, the current party breakdown is 51 Republicans, 47 Democrats, and two independents, though those two independents caucus with the Democrats. So this is effectively a 51 to 49 breakout, Republican to Democrat. And if you look at the seats up in 2018 all across the country, nine Republicans have to defend their seats, but 24 Democrats have to defend their seats and two independents. Um, many of these seats are very safe, but many of these seats – especially some of the Democrat seats in states where Trump won, um, are very competitive. And they're looked at by Republicans as potentially pickup seats, which is why, overwhelmingly, most political pundits will agree that the U.S. Senate is probably not going to change hands. And if you were to ask Republican leadership in the U.S. Senate, they'll probably tell you that they think they can pick up two to three to four, potentially, uh, seats in the U.S. Senate. In the U.S. House of Representatives or Congress, uh, we have 235 Republicans to 193 Democrats, and there are seven vacancies right now. Five Republicans, two, are with, two of which are from Pennsylvania, and then two Democrats. Um, every seat is up this year. Democrats need to win net 23 seats to win control of the House. That's a very important number, net 23 seats to win control of the House. I believe you need 218 um, to tie, so they, they're going to need 219 seats. Um, it's worth looking at average congressional midterm losses. So historically, here's what each party will lose in the midterm election when the majority parties also control the White House. So in the U.S. House, the average Republican majority loss is about 15 seats. The average Democrat majority loss is about 32 seats. But there are some things to consider in 2018. There are in, especially in the House, there, are a, there is a historically large number of competitive races. And looking at that, at those competitive races, believe it or not, 69 of the 78 most competitive races across the country are currently Republican-held seats. And you all know about the Democrat energy and fundraising that's happening. I, I just read an article recently that more and more young Democrats are registering to vote in Pennsylvania than ever before. And our very own Pete Tartline, our COO, um, works at a polling place. His wife works at a polling place in Cumberland County, and they were told, brace for high voter turnout. And I think that's going to happen all across the country. Will we see levels like we did in 2016 with the Trump versus Clinton election? I'm not sure. But for a midterm, um, there's a lot of energy there. There's a lot of energy on the Republican side, especially after Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed. Um, you're going to see a lot of voters at the polls. And again, looking back, there are a lot of folks who have compared 2018 to the year 2006 and that midterm election. Um, we can look at some of the polling numbers from 2006 and compare them to 2018 to see if these years are really going to match up. And you'll recall that in 2006, Democrats made huge gains in both the House and Senate. They won back both the House and Senate, and they effectively made then-President George W. Bush a, a total lame duck in his final two years in office. So the five things or five polling points that I think we can look at to compare 2006 to 2018 to see, is it going to be a big Democrat blue wave? Our unemployment rate, the presidential approval rate, are we on the right track? The congressional generic ballot, will you vote for a Democrat or Republican? And the independent generic ballot, asking independents, will you vote for a, a Democrat or a Republican? So the unemployment rate, 
believe it or not, is lower now than it was in 2006. The presidential approval rate is actually higher now than it was in 2006. Are we on the right track? That question is polling higher now than it did in 2006. The congressional generic ballot is actually lower now. In 2006, it was a 12-point swing for Democrats. Now it's about an 8. And the independent generic ballot, it was actually a 16-point swing in 2006. Now it's only plus 4 for Democrats. So um, while it is going to be a highly contested election and there are going to be Democrat pickups, I'm not sure if it's going to be the blue wave that everybody's talking about. So let's get to Pennsylvania. Um, we've, we've looked at the national uh, makeup of the U.S. House and Senate, but I do want to talk about some of the key Pennsylvania statewide races that are happening next week. And of course, we're going to start with Governor Tom Wolf versus former state Senator Scott Wagner. This is the gubernatorial election. In 2014, only four years ago, Tom Wolf, who was a businessman, became the first candidate in Pennsylvania history to unseat an incumbent governor, that was Governor Tom Corbett, running for re-election. And for the last three and a half years, Governor Wolf has traveled the state and he's touted a three-pronged focus for his administration, schools that teach, jobs that pay, and government that works. And you'll probably remember four years ago, he ran on enacting a tax on Marcellus Shale drillers and sending the, those funds to our schools. He banned his administration from accepting gifts of any kind. And his first year in office proposed, <clears throat> excuse me, proposed a tax increase or tried to get it through the legislature, but it was voted down. Wolf has only signed one state budget in his four years. Um, Republicans are running at him on tax increases, on the budget, on not enacting a Marcellus Shale tax. And Scott Wagner has really seized on this opportunity. Scott won a three-way Republican primary earlier this year. He resigned his seat in the Senate. And if you had asked me a year ago about this race, I would have told you that this was going to be one of the most highly contested races in the country. However, the race hasn't really been competitive in terms of polling. Polling numbers have consistently shown Wolf with double-digit leads, and Wagner's campaign has recently released fundraising emails that are begging for money, that are saying they don't have enough to run ads, to send mailers. Um, things don't look great right now for the Wagner campaign. Now, I can tell you from a PHCA standpoint, we held back-to-back -back events with Governor Wolf and Scott Wagner in early October. And we've tried to stay close to both campaigns and both candidates because obviously we want to make long-term care an issue in this election. And Governor Wolf came into the room and talked with everyone and, and gave a speech that included remarks about our certainly our sector, but other things that he's done. Um, Scott Wagner, on the other hand, spoke to our providers about really relevant issues. And, and while both candidates have a business background, um, Scott touched on lawsuit abuse. He touched on funding. He touched on regulatory reform. And I, I would think that all three of those things would be at the top of his to-do list if he were to win on November 6th. Now, to take a step back, Scott also draws a lot of comparisons to President Donald Trump for some of the comments he makes, for some of the things that he says um, at election stops. It's going to be closer than people expect. Um, however, looking at the polls and, and hearing what most folks around the state are saying, it does look like the governor um, should win re-election next week. But it will be interesting to see what happens in the next week to see if Scott Wagner can bring um, any votes out. He spent a lot of time in the southeast, a lot of time, believe it or not, in the city of Philadelphia, where a Republican generally would not win. Um, so we'll see what happens next Tuesday. Now, I do want to also talk about the lieutenant governor's race. Um, lieutenant Governor Mike Stack, pictured here in the middle there, I think sometimes – 
uh, gets dressed thinking that he's going to audition for a part in Boardwalk Empire. And I swear that's got to be the same, the same exact suit in that picture. But he actually lost the May Democratic primary to this man, Braddock Mayor John Fetterman. So right under the governor's race in Pennsylvania, you're going to see John Fetterman, the Braddock mayor, um, the Democrat, versus Jeff Bartos, a Republican businessman from southeast Pennsylvania. That should be an interesting race, though. That's going to fall in line with whatever happens with the gubernatorial election. If we move out to the U.S. Senate race, this is Bob Casey versus Congressman Lou Barletta. Um, you know, let's, let's look back 12 years ago. Bob Casey was elected to represent Pennsylvania in the U.S. Senate. He beat then-Senator Rick Santorum in one of the more surprising races of the decade. He ran as a pro-life, pro-gun Democrat that could surely work with both sides of the aisle. Though 12 years later, the biggest knock on Senator Casey is that he's fallen in line with Nancy Pelosi, with Chuck Schumer, with left-wing Democrats. And he struggled to find his 2006 roots. His Republican challenger, on the other hand, Congressman Lou Barletta, likes to tell that he was Trump before Trump. He was the Hazleton mayor. He advocated for strict anti-immigrant laws that especially today have been the subject of much debate. Um, the story goes that Barletta was asked to run for U.S. Senate, at, U.S. Senate by the president himself. And after a fairly easy primary win this May. Again, this is a race that should have been on the radar of every national Senate campaign advocacy group. We were really looking forward to seeing the results of this race. But truthfully, the Barletta campaign has yet to gain any real advantage over Senator Casey. I'm just now in Harrisburg seeing ads for this race. Um, I know campaign staffers are leaving the Barletta camp. I know that Casey's campaign has the momentum. Polling will show that Casey's up anywhere from 15 to 20 points right now. So it does look like Senator Casey should win re-election in a landslide. Again, there's a week left, and that's an eternity in, in a campaign timeline, but it does look like Senator Casey is on the right track for re-election. Before we talk about the U.S. House and, and what's going to shake out in Pennsylvania. It is worth noting that earlier this year, the state Supreme Court ruled that this congressional map that you see here was unconstitutional. And the state Supreme Court redrew that map. And you can see, if you look at this map, that there are some pretty egregiously drawn districts, especially, as I referenced earlier, Congressman Pat Meehan. That's the seventh in the corner of Southeast uh, Pennsylvania, it's been described as goofy kicking Donald Duck. And if you if you were to Google the PA seventh, the old PA seventh, you would probably see that that makes sense. But you can see this district or these districts. You can see that they were not drawn um, very fair in most cases. So the U.S. or the state Supreme Court threw it out, and they brought this new map. This new map has made many races much more competitive, and it certainly made Republican incumbents much more uncomfortable leading up to Election Day. So while there's 18 races in Pennsylvania, I do want to look at some of the most competitive or notable across the state. So the first congressional district, this is Brian Fitzpatrick versus Scott Wallace. Um, believe it or not, this is a Bucks County seat um, what I thought was going to be real competitive, Representative Fitzpatrick, who's the incumbent, is probably the most well-positioned Republican to win in this southeastern Philadelphia region. However, he's still going to have a major fight on his hands against Scott Wallace. Wallace is a wealthy philanthropist. His grandfather was a major figure in the Franklin Roosevelt administration. Um, polling will tell you that this race is a toss-up, but... Insiders will also tell you that Wallace's campaign has not been able to fundraise as much as they'd like. He's had to put out a lot of his own personal money, so it should be interesting to see what happens here. I would give the edge to 
Brian Fitzpatrick, but this is going to be a tight race. Uh, I read this morning that the spending for this congressional district has now eclipsed the Casey versus Barletta U.S. Senate race, which is pretty amazing um, because, again, this race is focused primarily on Bucks County. In the 5th District, this is Pearl Kim versus Mary Gay Scanlon. Um, this is an open seat. I, I do want to bring this up, and, and it's notable because though Mary Gay Scanlon will likely win this seat, um, this is going to ensure that Pennsylvania has a female congressional representative, and I think it's about time. But um, again, I do think Mary Gay Scanlon is going to win this seat, no problem. In the 7th, Marty Nofstein, who's a Republican, uh, is facing off against Susan Wild. This is the old uh, Congressman Charlie Dent seat. There was a bitterly contested primary here. Uh, Democrat Susan Wild, who's the first female solicitor of Allentown. Republican Marty Nofstein, who's an Olympic cycling gold medalist, and he's a small businessman. Both won their respective primaries. According to the polling in this district, um, this race could be one of the closest in the state, if not the entire country. This is a toss-up. Um, both candidates are gaining steam. Both candidates are on TV or sending out mailers. And turnout is, don't, is definitely going to affect who wins this district. Um, the Democrats do have a concentration of Democratic voters in Allentown. So they're going to need to turn out those voters in the polls. Um, that seat truly is too close to call right now. The 8th District is John Crin, who's a Republican, versus Matt Cartwright. Um, this is Lackawanna County and up in the Northeast. This is interesting because uh, Matt Cartwright is an incumbent. He had a fairly um, winnable district before the lines were redrawn. And when those lines were redrawn, it actually put him at a bit of a disadvantage. Um, I do still think he's going to be safe, but that could be an interesting seat to watch next Tuesday night on Election Day. And again, that's in mostly the northeastern part of the state. The 10th district, and this is where I live in Harrisburg. This is where we work in Harrisburg. If you had told me um, a year ago that incumbent Congressman Scott Perry would be facing a tough reelection battle, I would have told you that you were crazy. But redistricting happened. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court changed this district and they did everything they could to make this seat more competitive. And if the promise of a blue wave comes true, this is going to be a seat that likely will flip from Republican to Democrat. And this could actually be the, the uh, measuring point for the entire U.S. House and possibly even U.S. Senate. So George Scott, the Democrat, he's a retired Army lieutenant colonel and a current pastor here. Um, he's gaining steam against Congressman Perry, who's a former state rep from Pennsylvania and a military veteran. Perry is, is certainly the favorite, but again, national groups on both sides have poured money in here. It's the reason I got nine mailers in my mailbox this weekend. Um, it's a highly competitive seat, and this again is going to come down to the wire next Tuesday night. The 16th district is Mike Kelly, who's an incumbent, versus Ron DeNicola. I, I do think that Mike Kelly is going to be okay here, um, but Democrats have begun pouring money in. This is going to be a tighter than usual seat, but Mike Kelly should be fine. That's in the northwest part of Pennsylvania. And then finally, I think the most fascinating race in Pennsylvania, it's the only race in the entire country where two incumbents are facing off. Um, that's the 17th district out in Beaver County and Allegheny County. That's incumbent Connor Lamb versus incumbent Keith Rothfuss. Um, Rothfuss currently represents the old 12th district. Lamb currently represents the old 18th district. I hope I'm not confusing you yet. But when the congressional lines were redrawn, it was determined that both of these representatives would have to face off for the right to represent this new district. And you may remember Connor Lamb or that name. He made national headlines back in March when he won a special election to represent Pennsylvania's 18th district. President Trump had carried that district by a double digit margin in 2016. And recent polling has shown Connor Lamb with a 12 point lead over Keith Rothfuss. This race 
Should be fun to watch, but if you were to look at just the polling, you might have to say it's over already. So we'll, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens with those races. Those are some of our congressional races to watch in the next week. Let's look at some of the Pennsylvania state houses, and I want to do Pennsylvania state house and state senate, and look at some of those races to watch. It is worth noting first, though, the trend of incumbents who lost in the May primary. Now, I talked about Lieutenant Governor Mike Stack, who's a Democrat. He lost to um, Democratic Mayor John Fetterman. In the Senate, uh, Republican Randy Velakovic lost to a challenger, Jeremy Schaefer. Out in Allegheny County, uh, Cousins, Dom and Paul Costa, lost to Democratic challengers, both members of the Socialist Party. And Emilio Vasquez, a, a first-termer from Philadelphia, a Democrat, lost to a challenger. So those are some of the, the um, incumbents who lost primaries back in May. But let's look at some of the highly contested state house races in Pennsylvania this year. I want to first focus on the 157th district. This is Democrat Melissa Schusterman versus Republican representative and incumbent Warren Kampf. Um, this 157th district is truly the title fight of the state house elections. This race is sure to be close. It pits PHCA favorite Republican Warren Kampf against Democratic challenger Melissa Schusterman. Kampf is seeking his fifth term. Um, Schusterman, I believe her background is as a freelance television pr producer, and she's been a consultant for various media, media companies. This is a tight district and Camp has had multiple close elections but he did win in 2016 uh in a district where Hillary Clinton won he won with a 12 point advantage um everybody's going to have their eyes on this seat next week this is the number one seat that the trial bar would like to beat representative Camp the business community wants to keep representative Camp it's worth noting that Representative Kampf was the prime sponsor of our PHCA-backed House Bill 1037, which would have enacted a cap on punitive damages for long-term care facilities. He's been a supporter of PHCA issues since he took office in 2011, and we're doing everything we can to help him. But again, that's the number one race, hands down, in Pennsylvania. The 158th District, this is Democrat Christina Sappy versus incumbent Republican Eric Rowe. Um, this was a safer Republican seat in years past, but that threat of a blue wave looms very large over Eric Rowe. Uh, Christina Sappy is a former chief of staff to Carolyn Comitta, who's a Westchester area state rep. She's run a strong campaign. She even received the endorsement of the former Republican representative, Chris Ross, who held this seat. Um, up to 2016, but voter registration favors Representative Rowe. He should come out victorious in this in this election, though it is going to be close. And it's also worth noting Representative Rowe was a co-sponsor of House Bill 1037. He spoke in support of the bill on the House floor, and he's been in office for only two years, but he's been a strong friend and advocate to our sector. In the 151st district. Um, this is a matchup between Republican Rep Todd Stevens and Democrat Sarah Johnson Rothman. Stevens, in his career, um, he was in the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office. Rothman has been an assistant district attorney in Bucks County, and she worked as a, an attorney at Rudolph Clark, which is a big law firm down in the Southeast. The 151st District is split pretty evenly registration-wise between Democrats and Republicans, but Clinton carried this district in 2016. This is a seat that Representative Stevens has held since 2011, even when his district has elected President Obama and President or Clinton for president. This is going to be a close one. Um, I spent a few years working for Todd, as I mentioned earlier in this in this webinar. Uh, he was a supporter of House Bill 1037. He voted for it in the House Judiciary Committee. He voted for it on the House floor. And he's been with us, it's worth noting, on many of our issues. Out in the 119th, 
uh, in the northwestern part of the state. Uh, this is Democrat incumbent Representative Gerald Mullery facing off with challenger Justin Behrens. Uh, Mullery, before he took office, has worked in his, as an attorney and has even owned his own law firm. Behrens has been a social worker, and he owns a company now called Healthy Aging LLC. This is a, a rematch from 2016. Mullery won in 2016 by with a 12-point victory. However, President Trump carried 62% of the vote in that election in 2016. It's also worth noting that Representative Mullery was one of the fiercest opponents of House Bill 1037 for us. He spoke against the bill in the Judiciary Committee, he spoke against the bill on the House floor, and he obviously voted no. Let's take a look at some of the Pennsylvania State Senate races to watch, and I want to give you a few here, um, especially in the Southeast. So in the 10th District, this is rep, uh, former state rep, Steve Sanciero versus former state rep Marguerite Quinn. So this is a battle between a current and former House member. Marguerite Quinn currently represents the 143rd House District down in the Southeast. And Steve Sanciero was a former state representative of the 8th District, also in the Southeast. This is arguably the most contested state Senate race in the entire state. This district is relatively even. Republicans hold a slight advantage, a 2.5% uh, voting advantage. So this one should definitely go down to the wire next week. Um, it's worth noting Representative Marguerite Quinn was a no on House Bill 1037 earlier this year, and Rep. Santa Sierra was a no when the bill was voted on the House floor back in 2012. So this is going to take some work, whoever wins this seat, um, on us at PHCA as well as advocates in that district. In the 26th district, also in the Southeast, this is incumbent representative or incumbent Republican, excuse me, Tom McGarrigal versus Democrat Timothy Kearney. So McGarrigal has served as a state senator since 2014. This is the end of his first term. Kearney has served as an architect for a variety of groups. He's even been the mayor of the borough of Swarthmore since 2014. McGarrigal ran and won the tightest race in 2014 because this is one of the more democratic performing senatorial districts in the state. This race also should be extremely close. In the 12th district, it's worth noting uh, Stuart Greenleaf Jr. is running for his father, Stuart Greenleaf Sr.'s seat. Uh, Stuart Greenleaf Sr. is retiring this year. He's running against Maria Collette, who worked as a nurse and a nursing educator, and I believe worked with one of our members, Genesis Healthcare. Although Republicans hold a very slim advantage in this district, voter registration-wise, uh, Greenleaf Sr. has cruised to victory since in every election since 2006. He won, in, he won by 14 points in 2008, 28 points, in 2010 and 26 points in 2014 and most years frankly he doesn't have an opponent hillary clinton however carried this district uh, with a little over 15 51 percent of the vote in 2016. i bring this seat up because i do think that stuart greenleaf jr is going to win but his father senator greenleaf's departure from the state senate is really a, a big step in the right direction for us as tort reform advocates. When Senator Greenleaf was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, we were unable to get any kind of tort reform bill through that committee. He would not support it. So this seat, because Senator Greenleaf is retiring, is going to open up some possibilities for us and other tort reform advocates, especially in the state Senate. That's great news. And finally, I want to look at the 38th district. This is out in southwest Pennsylvania. This is Lindsey Williams, <clears throat> who's a Democrat, versus Republican Jeremy Schaefer. And I said earlier, um, Randy Velakovich, who was a state senator, was one of the incumbents to lose in the May primary. He lost to Republican Jeremy Schaefer. Um, the Democrats possess a sizable registration advantage, but this is an area that performed better than expected for President Trump in 2016. So Schaefer's going to hope to turn out 
most of those voters, or if not all of those voters, on November 6th. This should certainly be one to watch. And those are probably the four main Senate, uh, competitive Senate races um, across Pennsylvania this year. So let's take a step back. We talked about some of the races in the U.S. House, in the U.S. Senate, the gubernatorial race, the state house races, and the state Senate races. So what does the election mean for you? What does it mean for your staff, your building, and your residents? If you take a look at our issues and some of the main things that we've been working on for the last two years, Medicaid funding is number one. Lawsuit abuse reform and House Bill 1037 is by far number two. We're always looking at regulatory reform measures and, and how to get you back to providing care and being able, being able to provide care without interference. We've looked at staffing changes increases because this is something that members of the legislature are talking about, potentially increasing staffing levels. There's been a problem with um, civil monetary penalties, fines, the number of fines, the frequency of fines, and how much you're being fined for doing something. We're always looking at quality care and how to increase quality and how to improve quality care. What are the things we can do to do that? Community health choices. Phase one has been implemented in southwest Pennsylvania. Phase two will be implemented this January and then phase three in January 2020. We're looking at Medicaid pending issues and, and questions of presumptive eligibility, how to make sure you're getting paid for taking residents in on Medicaid. Workforce is an issue that's gaining traction all across the state in every kind of industry or sector, and we're very much included in that discussion. And then um, something that kind of brings all these issues together is unfunded mandates. Um, I track every bill that gets introduced in the state house or the state senate, and often it's it's alarming to me how many bills are introduced that would change the way you do something or add um, something more to what you have to do on a daily basis. We're constantly facing unfunded mandates from those who don't really understand what it is we do. So how can we ensure that unfunded mandates are not enacted on you and your facilities? So who are going to make our issues a priority? When you, when you go to vote, I mean, this is a very mixed, um, a mixed bag with these issues, but when you go to vote, you can look at some of the ways that each party could potentially help us. And, you know, I always find this helpful, especially in the federal level, when AHCA, the American Healthcare Association, does this and says, if this party's in power, here's what we can expect. But if this party's in power, here's what we could expect. So I, I do want to look at these issues and, and tell you that from a me Medicaid funding standpoint, Democrats are the party that that we would want to go with. Um, they look, they would look to raise funding, especially for Medicaid. That may come with tax increases, sales tax, um, whatever it is, but we can probably count on higher Medicaid number. Lawsuit abuse reform, that's a Republican issue. Regulatory reform, also a Republican issue. Staffing changes and especially increases. It looks like Republicans are trying to do that, so could the Democrats potentially be helpful? Uh, Republicans have have started to focus on the CMPs. Quality care obviously should be both parties, as well as workforce. That should certainly be both parties. Uh, community health choices and, and fixing, potentially fixing that system, because Governor Wolf is touting that, that's more of a Republican issue. Um, Democrats could potentially help us with the Medicaid pending because that's looked at as an increase in Medicaid funding. And then unfunded mandates, that should be a big Republican issue um, next year. So possibly the Republicans can help us with that. So what can you do as we get closer, and, and obviously we're a week away, what can you do um, to help and to get the word out about what we're doing here at PHCA and what some of your issues are. Every administrator across the state should have received one of these posters um, that focus on, focuses on votes on House Bill 1037. So again, 
House Bill 1037 was a lawsuit abuse reform measure. Uh, it went up for a vote in late June in the State House, and it failed, 103 to 91. But we at PHCA wanted to honor those who voted yes and ask why of those who voted no. And we want to make sure that your staff, your residents, that everybody sees how your state representative voted. So about two weeks ago, we sent out these posters that say, attention staff, and, and talk about your state rep and how they voted. And we want you to be aware of that um, coming up to the election. I understand if folks can't post it in, in your facilities, but at least have a conversation with your staff about it. At least bring folks together and talk about why this bill meant, what this bill meant to the sector uh, and what a yes or no vote did. We want to make sure that we at PHCA and you back in the districts support candidates who support us. And we've thrown out the word accountability a lot this year. We want to hold those legislators accountable. You can also welcome a legislator or a candidate into your building. And in the last week, candidates, whether they're incumbents or running for the first time, are going to be in a mad dash to see as many of their constituents as possible. So please take it upon yourself to bring a legislator or invite a candidate into your building, have them meet residents, have them meet staff, talk to them about our issues. And you can always call me or email me and let me know um, that you're going to be bringing somebody in and I can certainly give you talking points. Now, we are a week away and I understand that there may not be time to get a candidate in in the next six or seven days. So we at PHCA are going to begin a big initiative as soon as the election's over to get whoever won into every building across the state. Um, that includes state House members, state Senate members, and members of Congress. We want to make sure that especially all new representatives understand our issues, understand what they need to do, and understand how they can help us when they take office. Um, in January. If you want to find your legislator, you can certainly go on our website. You can call me, but you can certainly go on our website. Um, go on the advocacy tab. There's a locate your legislator button, and you can type in the address of your facility, your house, whatever you'd like to look up, and you can find who exactly represents you and your buildings. We have a lot of one-pagers on the website. If you go to the advocacy tab, Click on issue briefs. You can find things about budget, about lawsuit abuse reform and tort reform, quality care, managed care. I know the, the state budget is over this year and they're not voting on any more bills until January when a new session will begin in the state house and Senate. But um, these issue briefs would give you a good overview of what we're going to talk about. And again, while nothing is going to be concrete in November in terms of issues, we know uh, what is ailing this sector, and I think we know how to fix it. So we want to make sure we get that message out. So again, I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, I have 10.57 on my watch. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to take a nice long drink of water, and I will ask if any questions. Great. Thanks, Zach. I don't know about everybody else, but I'm feeling a lot more prepared to go to the polls next week. Uh, at this time, we'll open up the question and answer portion. If you do have any questions, please type them into the question box on the right hand of your screen. And we'll wait uh, a minute or two to see if any questions come in. Know that you'll also be able to reach out to Zach anytime, uh, you know, between now and the election, after the election, anytime. PHCA is here as your, as your resource um, in, in a lot of areas. Um, just want to... Thanks, Zach, again for uh, all of the information that he provided us today. And remind everyone that we do have regular webinars here at PHCA. Keep an eye out um, in your member communications on our website. Uh, we have a couple that are uh, coming up uh, in one in November, at the end of November, and another one in December. Keep your eyes out for those. We are going to be hopefully getting those out and starting promoting them. Uh, this week or next week. Uh, don't forget our annual convention is also coming up with some great sessions. We have those sessions and we're going to be starting to put those out 
Um, the, the program has been finalized, and if you haven't signed up, we'd love to have you. There's also PDPM training that we've added on as a as a additional training on Monday, November 12th at the Valley Forge Casino Resort. It'll be the afternoon of uh, November 12th, so sign up for it. Uh, that's important information that we want to get out to everybody. If you know anyone in your office or in your facilities who uh, would benefit from that training, uh, let us know, and uh, the registration's up on our website. I'm not seeing any questions at this time, so don't forget that a survey will be emailed later today, and the recording will be on um, the, our website later today as well. Uh, please take time to complete the survey. Thanks again to Zach for presenting on the topic, and have a great remainder to your day, everybody. Thanks, everybody.